Brett Fish, and this is Out of the Fishbowl. Now, in the previous episode, I spoke about the importance of curiosity and asking the right questions to try and understand why the world is the way it is and how it might possibly change and become a better world. I want to invite you in this episode to hold tightly to that curiosity, especially if anything that I start speaking about makes you feel uncomfortable or maybe starts to make you feel angry. Start by asking why. Why am I feeling that way? What is causing the discomfort? What am I scared of? But then, and maybe more importantly, ask yourself, is it true? Is what Brett Fish is saying true? And if so, what does that mean for me and for the world? The first movie I remember watching in the cinema was called The Right Stuff. And it was about a group of pilots and later astronauts. And I left that movie thinking that I could be a pilot or an astronaut. I vividly remember the giant rolling boulder chasing Harrison Ford as Indiana Jones in Raiders of the Lost Ark, which led me to believe I could be an adventurer or an archaeologist and the guy who gets the girl. Other movies I watched when growing up told me I could be a doctor or a ship's captain, a scientist or even president. Now, if I'd been born black and watched the same movies growing up, they would have shown me that I could be one of two things, either the bad guy or the help. And the help kind of ranges from slave to servant to butler. And then maybe in in an extreme third case, person number three that gets killed in a slasher movie, the token black friend. Now, as Roxanne Gay said, we assume whiteness is the default because whiteness historically has been the default. This is one of the many reasons diverse representation matters so much. We need to change the default. Well-known actor Idris Elba said it this way, I was busy, I was getting lots of work, but I realized I could only play so many best friends or gang leaders. I knew there wasn't enough imagination in the industry for me to be seen as a lead. John Leguizamo, a Latino actor, said, I had to do my own projects. It was an antidote to the system, to the holly woodentness of it all, because I didn't want to be a drug dealer or a murderer for the rest of my life. That's not me. That's not my people. Lupita Nyong'o, until I saw people who looked like me doing the things I wanted to, I wasn't so sure it was a possibility. Seeing Whoopi Goldberg and Oprah in the color purple, it dawned on me, oh, I could be an actress. We plant the seed of possibility. Now, how do we as white people become curious about representation when we've never had to worry about it because we've always had people who look like us in every significant place that we look? As Chandani Wiersba pointed out, without representation, it's easy to think that your voice experiences or identities don't matter. The community suffers because parts of it are neglected or ignored in decision-making that directly impacts their lives. Representation absolutely matters. And so we're going to take a look more closely at it in an episode I like to call Episode 2, It's Raining Men. So one reason why I feel slightly qualified to talk about this topic of representation mattering is because I found myself in a few spaces where it is being lived out well and have witnessed just how powerful it can be. So one of those spaces is SEO. I'm on the board of what is called NATEX, the National Executive of SEO, the Student Christian Organization. And I've been there for just about a year, I think, um, kind of happened during pandemic lockdown. And so a lot of what we've done has been on a WhatsApp group and Zoom conversations. And one of, one of the reasons that, that I, I really enjoy it is because in some senses, it's, it feels like it represents the demographic of the country. And so one white person in a room with a number of people of color. And I'm not the leader 
and my voice is often kind of held back. Um, I'm one one of a number of people that have conversation, make decisions, wrestle with things. And another reason why I like it is because we come from really different belief systems or styles of belief. So we have very different kind of ways that we think about Christianity because that is a space where we are Christian leaders. But it's not all the same. Like if if you watched us worshiping, if you if you listened to us preaching, like we have very different styles. And so it's such an interesting space, even just thinking back to last week's conversation on curiosity of of just being there and learning and listening and and how can I how can I learn from people that are very different to me in the way they believe things and do things and think about things. And so it's been such a rich space of learning for me, of of learning to lay down prejudice in some ways in terms of people that do things differently to me because these are incredible people. There's no doubt about that. These are – this is a room full of really amazing people. And so the fact that they think differently about some things really just adds kind of spice and flavor and causes me to not hold on to my style and way of doing things so tightly. And so I found that I've, I've, I've got a lot more space for people doing things differently and that's just been amazing. And then my part-time job is with an organization called Heartlines. I speak about them a lot. And – Again, during before pandemic, I used to have a boss and basically Brian was the only person that I knew in the organization. Then suddenly there's pandemic. Every week on a Wednesday morning at 10 o'clock, we started having staff Zoom calls. And that was one of the highlights for me of the pandemic, actually, because it, it gave me a chance to get to know the rest of my staff team because we are around the country. I'm the Western Cape rep. But we've got people in most of the provinces. The head offices are up in Joburg, and so we've got teams up there. And so it started with something like 12 of us on a call, and three out of the 12 were white people. And it has kind of grown a bit since then. We are probably around about 20 people now, and white people still very much in the minimum. But the main issue in that space was women, not being the issue, <laughs> but not being there at all. And so we had to be very intentional of noticing that and going, this is a great diverse group of men, um, but we are missing some valuable insight. We're missing perspective. We're missing voices of women. And so now the room is a lot more mixed in terms of that. And it has only strengthened things. It has only made things better. And so SEO and Heartlines are just two examples of spaces that I've been in, the the church that I'm part of, St. John's in Weinberg. Part of the reason I chose it was that it was a diverse space in Cape Town because a lot of Cape Town spaces somehow can still feel pretty white. And so if you want to be in diverse spaces, you have to be quite intentional. And in fact, episode two of season one of the podcast is called Divers vs. Diverse. Some of you will have listened to it, but if you haven't, go. I think it's one of my favorite. It's got one of the best lessons I learned in life. And I speak about the, the voices that inform and so when I was in the States, I was challenged about this notion of if I chose to read a book, it would typically be by a white, middle-aged American Christian man. And so from that point, I started to be intentional about listening to black voices, about listening to women's voices, about listening to voices of people with different belief systems. And so really just diversifying the voices that informed, that shaped, that gave me different perspectives. And I found that to be absolutely crucial. And I really, if you take nothing away from this episode more than that, like find ways to, to change up the voices that, that, that inform you. And so we spoke about movies where white people could play multiple roles. And it's, it's, it has changed. It is somewhat different. It's not perfect. Through the years, we have changed it. One of the things I was looking up while I was busy putting this episode together was Oscar, Oscar Awards and who was the first black person to get one. I think there's been something like 375 acting Oscars handed out and 22 of those have been given to people of color. And so apart from those instances, you've got, you've got children – of color watching movies and typically the people that are getting the big roles, the important roles, the roles that are being awarded are white people or that has been the past. But even as recently as a couple of years ago, we had a big 
kind of thing around the Oscars and how all the nominations were white again. And and so this is a constant conversation, but, but representation matters. And not only in movies, if I think back on kind of the history of South Africa, and as I'm talking about these things, some of them have changed because these are conversations people are, are having. They, they have shifted a little bit. I don't think any of them to, to where they need to shift. But I'm, I'm taking us back a little bit, but a lot of it will still be true today. I think of dolls. When I was growing up, um, girls typically played with dolls. There, there I am jumping into the gender role thing already. But, but when, when, when children were playing with dolls, the access they had was to white dolls. So you had Barbie and Ken and you had the, the non-generic version. But, but there, it was, it was really difficult for black children, colored children, Asian children to find dolls that represented them, that looked like them. And that becomes significant. And I think it's really hard for us as white people to understand why that is so significant because we've never not seen it. So anytime a white child played with a doll, it looked like them. Anytime a white child looked at the movie, they were seeing people that looked like them in all these roles. We could be all those things. And in fact, you take it to a ridiculous level that for the most part, a white person could look at Jesus – the character who was a Middle Eastern man and typically played by white people. So he could even be the son of God. And, and other people were just looking and just not seeing themselves in those spaces. And it's hard for us who always saw ourselves to really understand what that means. Another place which might seem silly again to those of us that it never affected is this thing of plasters or band-aids. That you injure your finger, you get a band-aid and on the box it says skin color. And that was never an issue for me because it always looked like my skin color. And only recently have, have people been making plasters and band-aids with other tones of skin color. But there was this idea, and it wasn't accidental, it was intentional, where whiteness was, was kind of seen as the norm, as the standard, and so skin color meant white. And so when I put a plaster on, it looked like my skin color. And for a black child... It must have been confusing spending your whole life putting plasters on that say skin color that looked nothing like your skin. So again, as white people, I never had to think about it. It wasn't an issue for me. But there was confusion and probably pain and this thing of like, why? why? What does it mean? Crayons, skin color. Like we, Again, I think it's intentional. It could have been pink or beige or white or whatever you're wanting to say. But they were literally labeled skin color. Somebody made an active decision on representation and what it said to me was this is you and what it said to a black child is this is not you. Representation matters. And an important question to ask alongside that is why are we who have always been overrepresented, so I'm speaking to white people, why are we so defensive about this conversation? And in South Africa, but also around the world, another place that I see this play out is panels. And on, on more than one occasion, there's been a panel of speakers that are speaking at a conference. And I jump into the comments and simply type, I see white people, kind of like a offhanded reference to Sixth Sense. And it inevitably explodes. People are so super defensive. Rather than looking at the panel in a country like South Africa where white people make up 8% of the population and 100% of the panel is, is white, is representing that 8% of and, – and people explode. How dare you question us and those are the only people we could find and those are the right people for the job as opposed to going there are experts in any of these fields in – all the different race groups, and you just haven't tried hard enough. And if there aren't experts in those fields, it's because we created systems and structures that kept them out of moving into those fields. And so, again, this all deals with, with curiosity. Like why, why in a country where 8% of people are white, do you have a panel that's 100% white? How does that happen? How is that possible? Another place, we, a very similar place where it plays out is leadership. And so I work in church spaces, and so I speak to those, but this is relevant in business and other spaces as well. But often you can be in a church space, and 
everybody out front looks diverse. And so people will say, oh, this is a diverse church. But the leaders will be white and the music leader will be white and those who make decisions about money will be white and the speakers will be white. And often there's one black person that gets to bear the load of of being this idea of a token person of color so that we can say we've got a person of color on our staff. And there, there are two ways of looking at this. And if, if you've managed to kind of hold on to what I said, might be uncomfortable or, or might be kind of cause the rising of defensiveness in you. If you've made it to this point, like this is going to be crucial. So, so really listen to this. We can look at this two ways. And the one is, oh, it's naughty and bad. Um, how can you not do that thing? Why, why aren't you giving representation to all the people? And there's truth in that. There's justice in that. There's, that is a right approach to this. But, but even more importantly for me is this idea of not so much the command of what we should do as the missing outness of it if we don't. The brilliance of diversity, not because we need to be diverse, but because we miss so much when we are not diverse. We miss voices, we miss perspectives, we miss stories, we miss history, we miss flavor, music, dance, color, all of those things. When there's a diverse crowd, different things are added to the mix. And one of the ways that that people have tried to work around this in a sense is this notion of colorblindness and people that talk about being colorblind, I don't see color, think they're doing a good thing, but I really want to challenge that notion. And I've heard this from black friends of mine. If you don't see color, you don't see me. And I think the other side of it is that especially in South Africa, where we have a history where race was such a key aspect, we have to acknowledge it to be able to move forward, to be able to undo things that were done badly, to be able to right wrongs, um, a lot of words that we haven't really kind of set out to do properly restitution and reparation and all those kind of things. If we don't see color, then we just kind of blank slated and move on from here. But in South Africa, we carry a history and it's painful. And, and many people bore the brunt of that more than other people. And so this idea that you don't see color, firstly, it's a lie. You see color. And if you don't see color, then I don't want to be driving with you when we come to a traffic light. You see color. The question is, do you judge people differently, negatively, because they are of a different color to you? And, and this, this, this notion of color blindness actually makes us miss out on who's in the room. When we're talking about those things we spoke about, different jokes or perspectives or, or life experiences, there are certain things that, that people of other colors and culture bring to the room that, that – are amazing that we don't want to miss out on. I'm thinking of coup sisters. I'm thinking of dance moves. I'm thinking of ways of storytelling. I'm thinking of kind of natural singing that just comes out of the crowd. Some of those things aren't present in white culture, and that isn't necessarily a bad thing. But when other cultures and groups are in the rooms, it means they add that to the room. And so don't be color blind. Be color affirming, color celebrating, whatever you want to call it. But the notion of color blindness actually removes people's stories and identities and histories and pain. And this extends into this, this notion of, of representation extends into areas of, of gender and race and ability and things like that. And I remember this advert came for a panel and it was about women – Sunday school teachers. It was a conference for women Sunday school teachers specifically. And the five people on the photo were five old, like really old, white American men. And it's laughable that you've got like an issue that was specifically aimed at women in a space and five men were the experts they found to talk about it. And Maybe another aspect, and, and this one again, this is a little bit complicated. It's a little bit confusing, and you'll understand as I talk about it, but, but including people not for the thing. So if you've ever seen, there's a show on Netflix called Superstore, and one of the characters, Garrett, is in a wheelchair. And 
what is interesting, what I really enjoyed about that show is that Garrett's character was not significant because he was in a wheelchair or his story wasn't always about him being in a wheelchair. He was included in the show as a person in a wheelchair and, and he was a character. He was, in a sense, just another character. And so it's that whole thing about being inclusive but not making the reason for the inclusivi- inclusivity the whole focus. And what was interesting as well is that Superstore was intentional. I did a bit of reading up on this in never explaining why he uses a wheelchair. So they really did their best not to make it a big focus. He was another character. He was lovable. He was like a really fun guy and part of the story. And and it wasn't because he was in a wheelchair. That wasn't the reason that they included him as a character. And why I say it is a bit complicated is, or problematic maybe, is that in real life, Colton Dunn, the actor that plays Garrett, is not in a wheelchair. And there's been a lot of conversation about that and things that need to, that conversation needs to go a bit further with things like blackface, things like actors playing people from other cultures and, and other groups. And so, so there's a definite space where maybe that wasn't done in the best way. But in one way, there's an aspect where we can look at that story and go, that is really good. Like there's a way of including a deaf character and the whole focus is not on them being deaf. And it's, it's just a part of them. But there's inclusivity because we're saying these are the people that are living around us and they are part of our stories. How do we include them without their difference being the story, if that makes sense? And then another quote that I really liked is representation is about demanding that we're all seen and affirming that we all matter. And that came from Pillar from Brooklyn. And then Morgan from Atlanta said, representation is important to promote the idea that it's vital that everyone has a seat at the table. And as we're speaking of tables, one, one good way to look at this is to, if you are someone that has a home that invites people around, who were the last five families that you invited to sit around your table? If you're somebody that has bries, who were the last five people or couples or families that you invited around? And, and if those all happen to be people that look like you, it's not saying necessarily that that's a bad thing, but it is saying that maybe in a country as diverse as ours, maybe you're missing out. Because when we start to bring different voices around the table, different people, this starts to really enrich every aspect of our lives. And in a society, in a country that purposefully divided people physically, geographically, and in many other ways put people in different spaces, we have to be super intentional about how we mix things up again. Diversity is not just going to naturally happen. We have to choose where are the spaces that we hang out, where are the spaces that we do entertainment, who are the people that we invite to our dinner table to our sports games, to whatever it is, our our trips away. And only if we're intentional in terms of inviting diversity are we going to start seeing it happen. Not for diversity's sake, not for tokenism or anything like that, but because we understand the richness that occurs when there are different people in our spaces engaging with us, people that we can learn from, that we can hear different views from, and ultimately create a community that that more represents maybe the country that we live in. Representation matters. And for me as a white person, there's, there's an incredible need for me to do the work in terms of understanding something that never affected me directly because it was all open for me. It was all pointed in my direction. It was all myself or people like me that were being represented. I need to do the work of understanding what that means for people around me, people that I care about, and how I can or what I can do to to maybe make things better, to to help this world be a more inclusive, more representational world. Maybe mine needs to be the voice that speaks up against all white panels um, or spaces that are leaning heavily towards whiteness. So 
So I hope that I hope that we will continue in the vein of of curiosity that that this is just one area that really needs us to ask questions. Don't get stressed about it. Don't get defensive about it. Just sit and think about what your life and your spaces look like and start asking some key questions. And those questions might at some stage lead to action, but they probably are going to take you on a journey of understanding and of, of becoming a better person to the people around you and in the spaces where you are. So thanks for listening and as always, please subscribe, follow, share this with people that you know maybe need to hear this particular message. Maybe there's a friend that you think this will be super helpful for. Tag them, send them the link, and let's take these conversations beyond just you and your headphones and a conversation being fed into your ears. Bring this around the dinner table, chat to your colleagues, friends, family. Let's talk why does representation matter? Does it matter? Did you agree with what I said? Um, did you get hectically offended by anything that I said? Let's be talking about it. Let's take the conversation further and let's see where this goes. Thanks for listening. <laughs>